welcome. Uh, I think people will be wandering in while, while we're doing this because uh, lots of people are interested in the topic. Why am I wearing a hat? And, uh, and also because uh, we're starting on time, which is violates all norms of, 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 uh, of talks, but we're going to do it anyway. I believe in starting on time. Uh, and um, it is my great pleasure, on behalf of the Center for Policy Studies, to welcome to campus Ben Ginsberg from Johns Hopkins University, who is uh, an eminent political scientist, uh, who we, many of us have benefited from reading his work, um, and uh, one, of the, one of the really best known scholars of American government, but has decided recently to study uh, a subject even closer to home, which is the university. Uh, ben, as many of you know, um, has spent 20 years at Johns Hopkins University as a, as a professor of, of government and has uh, held various administrative posts, in order, uh, including as a real administrative entrepreneur building quite an enterprise over there on uh, Massachusetts Avenue um, uh, in Washington, D.C., with the Center for the Study of American <coughs> Government and various uh, other related organizations. Uh, and he went to Hopkins after spending 20 years at Cornell. So he has spent some time in <coughs> universities watching, looking, and uh, has concluded that there are some problems that need addressing in the governance of universities. Uh, his book on this is getting a lot of attention. It is called The Fall of the Faculty, The, the Rise of the All-Administrative University and Why It Matters. It has won a bit of a chord with a lot of people in university faculties. And uh, he has kindly agreed to come here today and talk about that, and, which means you want to hear him, you don't want to hear me. So on that note, I will shut up and turn it over to Professor Ginsburg. Thank you, Joe. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll steal his applause. And, um, no, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I'm happy to see so many colleagues, and possibly are there deans, deanlings, et cetera, here too. Um, I uh, do not uh, pretend to be an expert on higher education. I normally write on uh, American politics, elections, bureaucracy, uh, other topics in the American government realm. But after uh, 40 years in the university, uh, I uh, came to some conclusions that I thought uh, colleagues might want to share. Uh, my Hopkins colleague, Bob Cargan, is, is here, and he's uh, some, he and I have talked about these things over the years. In fact, Bob and some others claim that they should share in the royalties because all I did was summarize our conversations. Um, maybe that's true, I don't know. Um, but the, the actual um, moment when I decided to write this book uh, was uh, something that I remember as the popcorn incident on the Hopkins campus. I was walking across campus with, with a friend of ours, uh, Matt Crenson, who then was uh, chair of the political science department, and we encountered an overwhelming odor of popcorn. And since we were gluttonous, we followed our noses, and we found in a, a building at Hopkins known as the Glass Pavilion, which is a big glass cube, um, huge quantities of popcorn being made. So we uh, barged in and tried to get some popcorn. They wouldn't give us any. Uh, and they said the popcorn was for a yield reception. Now, you know, everyone knows what this is. When students have been admitted and, you, you know, and we're trying to encourage them to accept, uh, we invite them to campus. They come with their parents. And at least in our admin, admin speak, that's called a yield reception. So uh, we looked around and noticed that there were many panels planned for this yield reception. There was a panel led by dining services, a panel led by uh, various functionaries advertising clubs and activities. Of course, the lacrosse coach had a panel. We couldn't do it without him. But there was, wasn't a single faculty panel. We were the university without a faculty. Students apparently were supposed to come to Hopkins to, to eat our food. Um, so we uh, wandered around and discovered, you know, the economics department didn't know about this, uh, our department didn't know. We barged into the dean's office and waylaid the dean, who was a biologist, and he didn't know anything about it either. The 
uh, staff had planned a yield reception uh, focusing on the things they thought were important, dining services and whatnot. So that's when I realized that the university had, you know, sort of gone off a cliff. Uh, that uh, what I thought of as the university uh, apparently had been, um, you know, hijacked at some point by uh, a group that I uh, later called Deanlets. Uh, now, several people have subsequently claimed to me that they invented the term Deanlet, uh, but since they didn't publish it, I don't care. It's mine. <laughs> um, now. You know, I'm sometimes accused of, of hating administrators, which is utterly untrue. As Joe said, I've done, personally done a lot of administration. I mean, Bob and I are both academic entrepreneurs at Hopkins. We've created programs that we think keep the College of Arts and Sciences afloat. In fact, we vie with one another. I tell my staff to make sure that we have more students than he has. And I know he tells his staff the same thing. Um, but between the two of us, uh, I think we probably, I, I don't, want, don't want to give a number, but we generate millions and millions of dollars. So I, I have great respect for administration done properly. Uh, but, you know, administrators sometimes are like candy bars. A small number is good for you. But too many, you get fat. Thousands of them, you know, your blood sugar goes up. You could have a stroke. Uh, or do I have my medical, I might have my, my medical uh, metaphors mixed up. Uh, and that, that's what's happened uh, to universities in recent decades. Uh, I mean, the, the published data are astonishing. Over the past 30 years or so, the number of students attending America's colleges has increased 50%. The number of professors increased 50%. The number of senior administrators has increased 85%, and the number of administrative staffers has increased 240%. Um, and, you know, this has given rise to what uh, I call in the book the all-administrative university, Admi universities that are run, and perhaps Case is not one of those, I, I can't say, uh, universities that are run by and sometimes for the benefit of their staffs and administrations rather than faculty and students. Now, you know, just to back up a step, there is, there is this mythology that professors are sort of impractical people. Uh, you know, we are uh, thought not to be able to balance our checkbooks uh, or do anything serious in the real world. But the, the, that's far from the truth. Uh, most of America's great universities were created by professors. Um, you know, I, I was at Cornell for 20 years. Cornell was created by A.D. White, who was an English professor of all things. Um, my current university, Hopkins, was created by Daniel Gilman, who was a geography professor. Now, I, I have often felt that he probably wasn't a very good geographer. He wouldn't have put us in Baltimore, but that's, that's my personal matter, matter of personal preference. Um, Charles Elliott, the uh, creator of the modern day Harvard, was a chemistry professor. And, uh, you know, William Rainey Harper, who created the University of Chicago, was a scholar of very impractical things, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Uh, you know, yet these, and, and, and Harper said, if you can master Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, you can do anything. And I think he was probably right. Um, not only were today's universities created by professors, uh, but until recent years, they were controlled by their faculties. Now, looking around the room, I see that uh, many of you are, you know, are my age or around the, you know, some a little older, uh, but uh, so you may remember this era. Yep. Um, but when I came to Cornell as an assistant professor uh, in 1972, um, we had a dean. Um, who was a very uh, eminent uh, economist, uh, Frederick Kahn. Um, I, I remember I, I disliked him a bit because my first year, I had a very good offer from the University of Washington, and I you know, very proudly presented it to him, and he looked at it. He said, you're not worth that much. So, uh, <laughs> damn economists. Uh, but we had a dean, uh, and we had um, one associate dean, 
and all and the, the dean was full time but fully expected to return to the faculty at the end of his term as he did the associate dean was part time and expected to return to the faculty full time and all other administrative tasks uh, including many of these uh, things that are now done by deans of students all other administrative tasks were uh, undertaken by members of the faculty. Now, I leave aside those that required particular technical proficiencies. Obviously, the university treasurer was not a faculty member. Do we have, uh, see, I'm trying to be nice. Um, and, um, you know, the, um, let's see, we didn't have IT then, but the, the person in charge of the typewriters, you know, knew something about typewriters, hopefully. But most of the tasks that today uh, have been turned over to staff and administrators were the responsibility of the faculty. Uh, you know, you remember this, when I, when I appeared, the department chair, who was not as nice as Joe, uh, assigned me an administrative task. I was the director of undergraduate studies, and he said, even you can do this. Um, and I did what I guess today is done by a host of staffers in the dean of students' office. I, I got to be pretty good at it. I enjoyed it. Uh, I think I gave the students much better advice than they get in the Dean of Students office. Sometimes they come back and tell me what advice they received. I, I always say, don't listen to them. In the Dean of Students office, they're constantly saying to kids, pursue your passion. If I hear that one more time, I'm going to shoot them. Uh, here you have these 18-year-old kids pursue their passion. What do they know? Somebody needs to tell them what that passion should be. Uh, you know, they're not your neoclassical consumers. They're not ready to, to pursue passions. Somebody needs to explain to them uh, the implications of different majors, the implications uh, of different curricula. They don't know that. Uh, but in the Dean of Students office, they're convinced that students should be encouraged to pursue their passions. I mean, as an aside, I had once had a uh, student, a freshman came in with his parents, very nice kid, nice parents, and uh, they explained to me that their son had been a star in high school in um, water polo. And one of the reasons he had come to Hopkins was our strength in water polo. Now, I have to confess, I didn't no, we did that. Bob, did you know we did water polo? No, that's the first I heard of it. But apparently we were very good in water polo. So I said, well, you know, I'm sure water polo is fun. I can, you know, you swim around, you hit a button, I don't know what you do. But uh, I said, you know, your son needs to focus on his academic subjects. Those will determine the quality of his future, not water polo. So get him out of the pool. Well, the parents were taken aback. The kid was taken aback. Someone in the Dean of Students' office had said, pursue your passions. His was water polo. Well, fast forward. Three years later, I meet the same little group. And now they're quite crestfallen because he has been quite a star in our water, water polo team. But it turned out that water polo was a traveling sport. And many of our rivals were on the West Coast. And he was constantly, I guess he didn't swim there, he flew there to swim, constantly away. His grades were terrible. He had uh, you know, a 2.5 cumulative grade point average. It wasn't going to get him into any graduate school. It wasn't, he had hoped to go to law school. That was, there was no chance that that would happen. And uh, you know, I listened to their sad story. I mean, I bit my tongue. I wanted to say, this is what you get for pursuing your damn passions, but. Uh, I, you know, I, I resolve always to tell that story to parents and kids. I mean, the faculty, in my view, gives much more substantial advice uh, than the uh, deanlets of students give. But anyway, um, in the traditional university, uh, most administrative tasks, those that didn't require specialized knowledge, were undertaken by the faculty um, on a part-time basis. It was assumed everyone had to do something. Everyone had an administrative task. You know, when the department chair decided that I had grown up a little bit, he promoted me to director of graduate studies. It was very exciting. Uh, but that was, that was my chore. Everyone had a chore. Uh, and we, I think, acquitted ourselves pretty well, right? And we did a good job on those things. Now, in recent years, 
um, we have been pretty much put out of the administrative business. Um, now, to some extent, you know, we're happy uh, to be left alone to pursue our passions. Sure, we're, we're as lazy as anyone else. Um, but nobody asked us. Nobody said, all right, uh, would, would you like to give up these jobs? Uh, gradually, and sit, you know, very gradually, uh, there was a process through, you know, in which more and more staff and administrators um, joined our ranks. Uh, and the faculty gradually stopped being asked to undertake not only minor administrative chores, but major ones as well. We were put out of the administrative uh, business until there was a dramatic shift in power at most universities. You know, if you give up the little things, you lose the big things too. And at most schools today, uh, decisions are made by administrators, often without any faculty consultation. Um, you know, at uh, Hopkins, one day we read in the campus newspaper, I, I never remember what it's called, the Gazette or the Chronicle, they all have one of those names. I call them Pravda and Izvestia. Um, we read in the campus newspaper that Hopkins would now have a new business school. And we read that um, the uh, various departments whose students might be interested in business careers would be gladly encouraging their students to attend the school. Well, this new business school was a, it was, it wasn't accredited. Nobody had ever asked anyone. The economics department had never heard of it. It was decided by the president, the provost, that this would be a good thing to do. Uh, or at uh, Florida State, the faculty read one day that their university was going to launch the first school of chiropractic medicine uh, associated with a major university in the country. Now the faculty uh, objected, particularly the medical school faculty, uh, which couldn't uh, resist pointing out that this was quackery uh, and that Florida State would now have be the first school of quackery in the country. Uh, but this didn't, um, didn't uh, trouble the president and provost. They, they moved forward. Um, uh, but unfortunately, the legislature cut off their funding. So, so we're still waiting for these new chiropractors to be produced. Well, you know, the, the examples we could multiply. I, I you know, know some of the case examples, so I won't tell you, know, you know them better than I do. Um, why has this taken place? I mean, why has there been a growth of administration, a shift in power? Um, some people say that, you know, it's the result of external mandates. You know, that the federal government now demands so many things from universities uh, in terms of uh, diversity, uh, other realms, uh, that, that our growth in administration has been a response to uh, external mandates. But, you know, most studies suggest that external mandates account for only a tiny percentage of these administrators. Very few administrators and staffers, for example, uh, work on reports to the federal government. And I discovered, um, at Hopkins at least, and people to whom I've spoken at other schools tell me the same thing, that very often external mandates are internally generated. In other words, you have administrators from the school seeking an external mandate that they can use to club the faculty. Uh, I encountered this in a very trivial way one day. Um, in the uh, Washington programs that, that I direct, um, I uh, established a uh, calendar uh, that was um, appropriate for the students we have, who are mainly part-time students. They work during the day. So the calendar and also course times had to be tailored to their needs. Well, for some reason, and I've never uh, quite found out why, some of our administrators didn't like my calendar or my course times and told me I should change them. I said no. Um, and then uh, an administrator whom, whom Bob and I both know, Catherine, uh, came in and um, said to me that the District of Columbia licensure board had mandated a change in my course schedules. Now, 
she showed me a letter. Now, I happen to know something about this board, and it, it's a, how can I put this charitably? It's a very lackadaisical board. Uh, I thought, why in the world would they have taken an interest in my course times? Well, it turned out that they were approached by our administrators uh, and asked to write this letter, which then could be handed to me. So, you know, as I've told that story around the country, people at a variety of schools have, have um, given me similar examples. You know, very often the external mandates are internally generated. Um, some people say that in fact, I, I had a long letter from um, a well-known political science professor who, uh, whose husband is an administrator. And she wrote to me that, well, one of the problems is that faculty are constantly seeking administrative positions for their spouses. That explains the growth of administration. Well, again, very tiny. Uh, and, you know, nowadays faculty are seeking other faculty positions for their spouses rather than administrative positions. I, I would say the, the true explanation for administrative growth is a little different. Um, one is that um, at some schools uh, a, an ambitious president or provost will endeavor to expand his or her administrative army in order to circumvent the faculty and take charge of the university. And this happens uh, over and over again. You've seen it. We've seen it. Every school in the country sees it at one time or another. You have a president uh, who wants to take charge. And one way that they take charge is by expanding uh, the troops under their control. Um, in the old university, the university that I grew up in, if the president lost the confidence of the faculty, the president couldn't do anything because we were the administration. All the administrative jobs were handled by professors. Uh, and a president who was out of touch with the faculty was dead in the water. That president had nowhere else to turn. Today, if a president is able to expand his or her army of deanlets, um, that president can become, you know, political scientists like to say, relatively autonomous. Uh, that president uh, has the wherewithal to uh, act on his or her own without the support of the faculty, often without the knowledge of the faculty. So one major source of administrative growth is uh, presidential imperialism. Uh, you know, just as it is in the national government sometimes. Not every president is like that, but all you need is one, okay? All you need is one, and the ranks increase. A second source of administrative growth is, uh, you know, is this Parkinson's law? Bureaucracies grow themselves. Um, and, you know, this is something we see all the time. I have seen so many um, groups of administrators and staffers create work that didn't need to be done, but then creates the basis for hiring more administrators and staffers. Um, you know, we had at Hopkins one day, it was announced that we uh, now had a committee on traditions. And this, this committee on traditions, consisting of several deanlets and staff whom they hired, uh, was going to look into uh, university traditions to see if there were any traditions that could be revived that we might have forgotten. And failing that, it was going to invent new traditions. Uh, now, we were sort of taken aback by this, but a Google search revealed that we didn't even think of this on, on our own. Uh, Twenty other schools had already created such committees on traditions. Uh, this is known in the administrative world as best practices. <laughs> so the committee on traditions met all year long, and it came up with a tradition. It invented a new tradition for us, and that tradition was high table. Um, and their version of High Table, I think, was inspired by Harry Potter rather than, <laughs> rather than Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, but uh, 
I, I thought that if, if they could make themselves disappear, that might be good. Uh, <laughs> but that was our new tradition uh, based on a year of effort. Or uh, another group of, of uh, staffers at Hopkins uh, constituted themselves, and had to hire staff, constituted themselves as the War Zones Task Force. And their job was to try to find out, or to try to develop a policy uh, on student travel into war zones. Now at the end of a year of meetings, they announced a policy, and that was that students should be advised not to travel into war zones, unless they lived in war zones. Now, I think we could have you know, come up with that without a year of meetings, but I don't know. Um, so so these, these make work activities uh, seem, you know, silly, they're funny, we chuckle about them, but these become the basis for the growth of administration and staff. These activities justify the need for more managers. Uh, reports are issued, staff, staff is brought in. Um, you know, to, to, I, I hate to pick on Hopkins, but these examples, my Hopkins examples come to mind instantly. Um, we had a uh, summer session, I and mean, Bob will probably remember this. So I can't tell my stories right with Bob sitting here. Uh, he's keeping me honest. We had a summer session, you probably have this too, uh, where high school students are, you know, come for the summer, pre-college they call them, come for the summer and they live in the dormitory, take a couple of classes, and they have a good time, their parents pay tuition, it's, a, it's fine. Um, so we had a very successful one. We would draw 400 pre-college students every summer and this was run by one staff person who would hire uh, undergraduates to work with her during the busy season. So very cheap. Unfortunately, she passed away, and this uh, activity was given over to an assistant dean, a deanlet. And this assistant dean held meetings for months, went around and met with everyone who would meet with him. I met with him one time. Uh, we met for an hour. And I think I told him the same thing everyone else told him, which was print brochures, go around to secondary schools, meet the guidance counselors, recruit students. It's not rocket science. Well, he, he told me these were good ideas, but he couldn't personally do these things. He was going to hire staff to do these things. So after a few months of recruitment, he had four or five staffers who now took the place of this one poor woman. Uh, but these four or five staffers apparently didn't want to do any of these things either. They had lots of meetings too. And the end result was we now had five people working on the summer session but only had 20 students. Whereas we used to have 400 students and one person. Um, so I complained to the dean. And the dean, you know, shook his head. Uh, and said, well, sometimes things like this happen, you know, and you have to be patient. It turned out everyone was satisfied except me uh, because all the people in the administration, you know, now had more direct reports. So everyone had aggrandized their, their position. There were more staffers around. Everyone was happy, even though uh, a fairly substantial income stream was lost. Um, other factors that are, that are important in the growth of administration, um, one is professional fundraising. Now, um, universities nowadays, as you know, hire uh, armies of fundraisers, and they make use of what's called the Ward, what used to be called the Ward method of fundraising. Uh, Ward was a uh, Chicago fundraiser in the early 20th century who preached that um, or institutions and organizations could raise money more effectively if they uh, built a uh, staff of fundraisers and instead of seeking you know, a large bequest from one wealthy donor, a Rockefeller or whoever, uh, these armies of fundraisers worked all year to get smaller, smaller grants, smaller gifts from lots of people. Uh, and that's what we do today. We have our, uh, our uh, fundraising you know, development office, uh, which approaches donors on a constant basis. And sometimes they're pretty effective. The problem with this is that um, 
the university's increased dependence on fundraisers diminishes the university's interest in intellectual activities. When I came to Hopkins in uh, 72, uh, we were going, the, the school was going broke. If I had known that, I never would have left Cornell. But anyway, the school was in desperate financial shape, and the president called me in and said, I want to do more in Washington. I said, what do you want to do? He said, I don't know. I was happy to, to try and do more, and then Bob and others. Uh, and because the university was impecunious, it looked to the creation of academic programs. Uh, its lack of funding became a reason to become intellectually more exciting and interesting. Actually, Adam Smith made this point. Uh, then our fundraising efforts began to take hold. And as successive presidents and provosts saw money coming in from their fundraisers, they became less interested in people like me or people like Bob who were entrepreneurial. Our entrepreneurial ideas were greeted with yawns. Well, it might be interesting. Well, they, weren't, they, didn't, need that, they didn't need the money that way anymore. And in fact, I discovered to my, I was naive, I discovered to my dismay that administrators preferred the money cre you know, that came in from fundraising to the money that Bob and I and others generated. And the reason was simple. If they're dependent on the money that I generate, then they're dependent on the faculty. If, on the other hand, they can raise money via the development office, those people all work for them and have no power whatsoever. So that's much to be preferred. Um, another uh, factor that I think is important in uh, the growth of administration is the turn uh, to, to corporate headhunters uh, for the recruitment of, um, well, first presidents, now provosts, deans, uh, in some schools, department heads are recruited by professional headhunters. Uh, my experience, you know, the, the headhunters vary. I've, I've met a number over the years. They vary in quality. But on the whole, they don't know the academic world as well as we do. Um, they don't know the candidates as well as we do. Very often, you know, when, we ha when a school has a, a, a new president or a new provost who is a disaster, uh, people say, where did you get this person? Well, professional corporate headhunters who don't vet the candidates appropriately, don't know what to ask, don't know what to look for, don't know how to read a CV, uh, we know. Okay, we can call our friends at other schools where that person has been and get the lowdown. Collectively, we can tell you exactly what that person will be like. Uh, you know, we had a president once, maybe even now, I don't know, who many people thought was a megalomaniac. And I remember um, one of the editors at the Chronicle of Higher Ed said to me, why did you people hire that guy? Everyone knew he was a me megalomaniac. And I said, we people didn't hire that guy. That guy was hired by corporate headhunters who presented him to the trustees. The faculty wasn't consulted. And you know, this, this uh, has been another factor uh, contributing to the um, you know, downfall of the, university, of the faculty and the university. Well, um, let's see, I've probably taken up more time than I'm supposed to. Um, these developments are damaging to the, to the university, damaging to higher education, damaging to students in, in many, many ways. Uh, generally speaking, um, what has happened is a shift of ends and means. When the faculty is in charge, to us, the end of higher education, the goal, the purpose, teaching and research, that's what we're for. The means is the institution. When administrators take charge, there's a reversal. To them, the end is the institution. The means 
of drawing customers to that institution uh, is teaching and research. These be what to us is the end, to them uh, becomes the means. And that, you know, in my view, undermines the university. Uh, it creates, in many instances, what I would call the consumer-friendly, happy university. I had a graduate student some years ago whose first job was at a uh, very good public university in Virginia. And his first year, he gave the students really tough grades, gave a lot of C's, some D's, some F's. And the dean called him in and he said, young man, our U is a happy U. Whenever I drive past their campus, I oh, there's the happy U. Uh, well, to the, to the dean, this student was interfering with customer relations. He was diminishing the likelihood that these customers would return to that campus. They might go elsewhere. Uh, to the dean, uh, who was not an academic, not an academic, to that dean, uh, the purpose of the class that my student was teaching was to attract customers to the university. Not to, not to teach, but to attract customers to the university. So happy you was being hurt. Um, also generally, I would say that, um, you, know, what, and, uh, you know, as I said at the outset, I, I'm not a, an expert in higher education, but I do know something about bureaucracies. That's a topic that I've studied most of my life. And most students of bureaucracy will will tell you that in an organization whose uh, employees are well-educated professionals, the organization works most effectively and efficiently if those professionals are given a maximum of uh, discretion. Um, organizations that are hierarchical, rigid, uh, you know, they go the way of, of the old General Motors. Uh, which paid no attention to its engineers. It was run by people who, you know, could get into a car and drive it, but didn't know much about cars. Uh, you know, a story that, that many of us learned in graduate school from, from Jim Wilson uh, is the story of why the German army defeated the French army so easily in 1940. Uh, contrary to what we think about the Germans, in the German army, junior officers, uh, non-commissioned officers were taught to exercise discretion. They were expected to exercise discretion. So when the German tanks arrived at the Meuse, there had been some glitch in the plan. The combat engineers hadn't shown up to build pontoon bridges for the tanks to cross. So what happened? The junior officers, led by one uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rommel, hopped off their tanks and waded across and engaged the French. The French, on the other hand, had a different kind of army. In the French army, there was no discretion as you moved down. Orders came from Paris. So sitting there was an armored infantry division that could have destroyed the Germans as they tried to wade across. But they didn't have orders about this. They were supposed to shoot at tanks that came across pontoon bridges. Their orders didn't cover this new development. They had to radio Paris for instructions. Well, you know, by the time Paris deliberated, the instructions came back, the French had already surrendered. Uh, and, you know, our universities functioned best uh, when the faculty had maximum discretion. And they don't work well when we try to turn them into the French army or into General Motors. They might we're surrendering. So what can we do? What can we do? Well, the first uh, step in doing anything, I'm a Leninist, so the first step is consciousness. You know, we have to be aware uh, of the fact that our uh, place in the university has been eroded, our power in the university has been circumvented. We have to become aware of that fact. Uh, sometimes people write me little notes saying, can't we all just get along? Well, no, not really. Uh, <laughs> actually, no, we can't all just get along. We have to be conscious of our interests uh, as a faculty, and we have to be conscious of how the faculty serves the university of our importance in the, in the university. So consciousness is the first step. Second, uh, we need to be obstreperous. Now, case faculty were obstreperous uh, not so long ago. 
Uh, now, being obstreperous is important for, for a very good reason. Um, who was who it? Um, Anthony Grafton said in the New York Review that I, I was uh, snarky. He accused me of high snark. Uh, is that better than low snark? I'm not sure. Maybe. Well, being obstreperous, being snarky, it's very important because in struggles between administrators and faculty, uh, one advantage that we have is that in our world, being controversial is good. In our world, having views that are different from those of everyone else is good. Uh, in fact, if I have an idea for a book and I see somebody else has already done it, I see people already agree with that idea, I reject it, That's a, what, what good is that? I only want to say or do things that other people haven't said or done. But in the administrative world, it's a little different. An administrator who is controversial, who is involved in struggles, that's usually a career ender. Um, now, there are some who are charmed, you know, there, there are Teflon coded administrators. You know, we, when we look around, we see some. Uh, not here, but, but at other places. But for the most part, in the administrative world, they're eager to avoid conflict, struggle, uh, public clashes. And that's our advantage. We have to be willing to be obstreperous. Uh, third, and you know, the, some, some will think that this is uh, immoral, unfair. You know, when we, we earlier on, Joe was uh, asking, was talking about the uh, latest Herman Cain revelations. Well, in Washington, we call this opposition research. There, there are about 100 firms in DC that do, do this full time. Uh, the rest of us call it dirt digging. It, it's part of politics. I wrote a book about this once, Politics by Other Means. Um, if it comes down to it, faculty have to be willing to engage in opposition research. And opposition research is very effective precisely because the uh, corporate headhunters who vet uh, administrative appointments often don't know what they're doing and often will allow the most egregious false claims on resumes to creep in. Uh, you know, some of you may know this, a few weeks ago, the uh, senior vice president at Texas A&M had to resign. Or no, he didn't resign. He needed to spend more time with his family. Uh, why, did he, why did he suddenly discover that he needed to spend more time with his family? Well, it seemed that he had gotten into a conflict with the faculty, which investigated his, his resume. And the first thing they discovered was that he, he had claimed on his resume to have been a senior <coughs> naval officer Indeed, a Navy SEAL. Pretty hot stuff. Well, they checked with the Navy. Navy said it never heard of him. He said, well, my missions were so secret <laughs> <laughs> that they had to deny. So the faculty said, OK. So now they knew that they need, needed to look only a little further. And his claim of uh, having a PhD from Tufts was investigated. Turned out he had once attended a seminar there but had no PhD. Now, how could this happen? So he, he needed to then spend more time with his family. How could this happen? Well, I've been on, on uh, back when faculty were on administrative search committees, I was on many and discovered that very often resumes were filled with fibs. Why? Well, faculty, you know, faculty resumes are pretty straightforward. People claim a book, they wrote it or they didn't write it. Now sometimes they do, you know, there are fibs on those, but very seldom, because you know, it's easy to find out. Did you write the book or not? Did you write the article or not? It's there. But administrative resumes are a little more uh, iffy because very often there's nothing concrete that they can claim. Uh, they participated in, they inspired, they, they did sort of fluffy things. So there is a temptation to take the fluff and puff it up a little bit. And so I would say that maybe a third of the administrative resumes that came before committees on which I served contained fibs. So, you know, if it gets serious, opposition research is a powerful tool. Look at poor Herman Cain going down the tubes. Um, so, uh, but, but it, you know, if you don't want to dig dirt, uh, some other suggestions I have. Uh, number one, uh, their demand a faculty trustee. OK? 
And most schools do not have a faculty trustee, they have a student trustee, all sorts of people, but no faculty trustee. And I don't know, does Case have a faculty trustee? No. Um, <laughs> and that faculty trustee needs to be elected by the faculty, not appointed by the administration, uh, because if the administration appoints the trustee, the president will appoint, I believe the technical term is a suck up. Uh, stooge. Stooge, right. Uh, yes. <laughs> Quizzling. Uh, so, an elected faculty trustee. Now, faculty trustee is only one vote, but it's an important presence because many trustees are loyalists. They want to do good for the university. Okay, they're alumni, they're loyalists, they want to do good, but they have no idea what's going on. Okay, they read the, they read the administrative rag, uh, which is Pravda and his Vestia rolled into one. They attend the trustees meeting, which is a dog and pony show. Uh, you know, they're told, they're, they're presented with a view of the university that is um, perhaps not fully accurate. Uh, and it's important to have a faculty member there to present uh, an alternative perspective. Um, if there is a faculty senate, a faculty council, some faculty body, that body needs to create its own House on american Activities Committee. In other words, it needs to create an investigative panel. We are constantly being investigated. Uh, it's important to have a permanent institution, a permanent entity that looks into, from the faculty's perspective, examines university finances, examines administrative decisions, asks for documents. If the documents are not forthcoming, that's a news story. That's called stonewalling, right? And is a, is a crime in and of itself in DC, anyway. Uh, now, you know, all this takes time, but, but it's essential. Um, so, and, oh, and, and one, one last uh, point I want to make is that, you know, even though, uh, you know, our advantage is that controversy is good for us, bad for them. Our disadvantage is that we're individualistic and they are a bureaucracy. Bureaucracies are insidious. Bureaucracies proceed, they're, they're very patient, they proceed in tiny, tiny steps. Each step seems very plausible. Why would anyone object to it? But they accumulate. So my uh, you know, general advice is oppose everything. <laughs> if you can't see a good reason for it, if you can't see a positive affirmative reason for it, oppose it because ultimately it will lead to no good. So let me stop there and uh, take questions. Oh, by the way, I, I do want to, I want to um, thank you. I want to share with you, I, I should have given you this for, uh, for, for the uh, board. I gave a talk at Purdue the other day and the AAUP chapter there told me that um, their president had asserted that there had been no administrative growth whatsoever at Purdue. Um, well, you know, Purdue, it's an engineering school. Engineers, you tell them a number, they go for it. So here is a chart. I don't know if you can see it, but this is a chart yeah. that the Purdue faculty yeah. produced. It's a public institution. The numbers are public record. Yeah. This green line is graduate assistance. The black line is faculty over a 10-year period. The red line, administrators. So fac faculty growth, there was faculty growth in 10 over the last 10 years, 12%. Graduate student decline of 26%. Administrators increase of 58%. And I don't know if you can see this, but these shadowed uh, bars, that's tuition. And curiously, they track. they track nicely. Uh, and one of the, one of the uh, damaging uh, results of administrative bloat, growth, uh, has in fact been uh, the cost. You know, something like, I and mean, if you take, I'm going to charge them indirect costs too. Uh, if you take all costs, it's about a quarter of the 
uh, expenditure of the university, I believe, can be attributed to the cost of administration. So if you want to cut costs, I you know, often say at lunch, every third one, randomly. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, we've got lots of questions. You don't want to hear from me for sure. It's going to be Ken, and then David, and then John. And I'm going to ask not to need to to move this around, because uh, we're going to try to record the questions. Okay. Yeah, this never works. Yeah. This is a quickie. Uh, the phenomenon you're referring to, the, the growth of administrators, the takeover of the institution, has happened in many fields in America. Yes. Uh, in healthcare, in Absolutely. hospitals, in other sorts of institutions, probably in the corporate world as well. So what is it common? I sort of... Uh, I have a well, tendency to want to blame uh, MBA programs, but... I yeah, don't well, I don't know if MBA programs are a symptom or a cause, but uh, in almost any field where, uh, where you know, there is a, an ongoing, successful, productive endeavor, there will be those who can't actually do whatever it is that's being done there, the people who can't practice medicine, the people who can't write books and teach courses, who do find ways of attaching themselves to that field in a, in a parasitical way. And that's happened in, in a number of areas. I mean, I, you know, in my book, I tell um, the uh, one Hopkins story, which is uh, not an unusual one. Um, you know, we uh, created the position of vice provost for undergraduate education. And that individual has become a very powerful figure, large staff, many direct reports. But of the three vice provosts for undergraduate education that we've had, not a single one has ever taught an undergraduate prior to becoming, prior, prior to being elevated to this position. Uh, not a single one has ever written a book or paper prior to being elevated to this position. These are people who uh, have attached themselves in a parasitic way to a very successful endeavor, namely the university. And uh, this is happening everywhere. Uh, you know, I remember the, um, I went, when I was writing the book, I don't know, for some, this was probably silly, but I was thinking about the old Star Trek. Uh, remember there were the, the Borg, uh, and they would always say, you know, you will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. Uh, now, Captain Picard always unlimbered his phasers and resisted. Uh, but, you know, the Borg have taken over a number of fields. Healthcare is a prime example. Uh, I, I really appreciate your, your comments in general, but I have a question uh, about pushing your analysis maybe another step further. This, this university is unusual in the balance of its faculties in different fields. Uh, but the way you spoke, you were assuming that the faculty share a common sense of mission and a common sense of purpose. At this institution, I don't think that's true. And I don't say that in criticism mm -hmm. of other faculties, but they just live in different worlds. Well, I, I, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right, except that all faculty uh, share a sense of mission in the broadest terms. And that is, we all uh, share the idea that an important component of our mission is training students, undergraduates, graduates. We all share the notion uh, that an important part of our mission is uh, the production of scholarship, whether it's in the laboratory, in the library. Uh, so, you know, I think there are very few faculty for whom teaching and or research are not critical missions of the university, whatever their field might be. I, I guess you're not taking medicine into account. Well, academ academic physicians uh, care for patients as well, but the difference between academic physicians and practitioners is their research and teaching mission. You know, my, my wife was an academic physician for many years, and uh, most of her day was spent training house staff uh, and, uh, you know, preparing uh, publications. Uh, so her world uh, and my world were not so different. Uh, I just didn't, I, I, you know, uh, I would probably be reprimanded for touching the patients, though. <laughs> to what extent do you think that the 
rise of the sense that universities are businesses either accounts for the growth of administration uh, or has yeah. affected the well it, it, it becomes um, it becomes a justification that is cited um, and administrators will often say uh, look uh, you faculty are living uh, in a world that doesn't exist anymore we are now a business you know, I remember the, uh, the president at the University of Chicago who, who was ousted, uh, Hugo Sonnenschein, uh, used to say, well, you know, we are a business. We are not the kind of enterprise that you people uh, like to think we are. Well, that, that's somehow, that's so dismissive of the faculty. We know, we know that the books have to balance, and we can be pretty damn good at it, too. Um, you know, I... Sometimes I'm shocked by what our business people do. I, I, Bob knows the story, but one day um, in, the, in a program that I direct, we had 60 students more for the introductory course than we had projected. So in order to accommodate those 60 students, I need to, needed to hire three more graduate teaching assistants. Now each student paid $3,000 in tuition for the course. So let's see, that's three times six, that's $180,000. Three graduate assistants at $4,000 each, let's see, that's $12,000. So the net result of my plan to hire three more graduate teaching assistants would have been a profit that even I could calculate of 160 some thousand dollars. So thinking that this was obvious, I went to the assistant dean for finance who looked at me and said, well, that $12,000 is not in the budget. I said, well, I understand it's not in the budget, uh, but just give me the 12,000 and I'll give you back 180,000. He was unimpressed. He said, that's a different page. What kind of damn business is that? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't have an MBA, thank God. Uh, but I could subtract 12 from 180 and see that we were, what, what, were ahead of the game. Um, so I think very often when administrators say, we are now a business, that's just an effort to dismiss the faculty as being unaware of proper business methods. When in fact, uh, most of what needs to be done is not high finance. Most of what needs to be done can very well be done by the faculty. Uh, you know, we, uh, again, uh, uh, can be, not all of us, you know, we have a division of labor, uh, but many of us can be entrepreneurial, many of us can balance the books, and many of us have really good ideas. And, you know, when you talk about business, um, you know, Bob had a great idea for a new program one day. And his, pro his idea was a program in urbanistics, which was a mix of economics, politics, city planning. It's a wonderful idea. So um, we present this idea to one of our, I don't know if she's a dean-led or a dean-ling. Somebody had to approve this. Someone who was always saying, we need to think outside the box. So we present the idea, and what response do we get? Well, have you done market research? I said, look, if it's outside the box, market research will prove that nobody's ever heard of it. So if you're gonna be innovative, entrepreneurial, sometimes you fly by the seat of the pants on your instinct, because what you learned in business school is not gonna cover this. Well, she was very dubious about this. It was annoying. Uh, so, you know, very often when, when administrators talk about business, it's not that we can't do that. We understand business. We know the books have to balance. We're not nuts. Uh, this is just a way of shoving us aside. Hi, I'm uh, Ted Steinberg from the History Department. I'm also the uh, president of the local chapter of AUP. Inclination, I think, would be to tell the war story uh, that explains why I am the president. Go ahead. Hey, you, I'm not going to, <laughs> but all I'll say, it'll raise the hair on your head. The most on my head, that would be tough. <laughs> yeah, 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 
<laughs> the power of the most breach of that. Well, tell the story. I, I, I want to hear. Let's, I want to ask my historical yeah. question uh, first. Okay. Actually, I think it, 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 it's, it's, it, it's, a follow, it's kind of a follow-up on John's question. I, I read your book, finished it last night. And um, the question I have as a historian is, this seems to start about 30 years ago. Uh, and that's what your mm -hmm. book suggests, and that's what your, your own story here today suggests, to talk about the early 70s being a Cornell thing and different. Well, uh, as a historian, I'm trying to understand why it explains this. And I am wondering whether you think that it's in fact uh, the case that it was the fiscal crisis in academic life that began in the early 70s. Uh, and by that, I'm talking about the cuts in uh, uh, state aid to public universities, and also the switch from, in federal aid from direct grants to universities under, under Johnson to under Nixon, private, uh, essentially individual Yeah, I think, no, I think that those are very good points. I think those are, those are part of the story, the, the switch in federal aid, so that the customer carries their own uh, aid with them. Uh, and related to that is, our collective loss of market power. Uh, yeah. The reason that faculty became important in the post-World War II period is that we were in short supply. You know, I remember the, um, the story that uh, Walter Murphy at Princeton told me, uh, came back from the war, uh, received a faculty appointment at Princeton, the dean called, he's a political science professor, an expert in constitutional law. The dean called him in and said, Walter, we have lots of new students because of the GI Bill, and we need someone, another person, to teach freshman economics. And Walter said, I don't know anything about it. And the dean said, Walter, that's why we have a library. <laughs> you know, this was a period of faculty shortage, uh, lots of students who came to school under the GI Bill, who had federal aid of various sorts, and because of that, this is the period during which te the tenure system solidified, uh, the period during which our bargaining power was greatest. Um, but um, over the ensuing decades, uh, our market power diminished sharply. We have overproduced. You know, we have huge numbers of, PH of unemployed PhDs who you know, are available as contingent faculty uh, only about 25 or 30 percent of the current um, university and college teachers in the country are line appointments. The rest are contingent. Uh, the contingent faculty have no rights, uh, no power, and they are badly treated, and their availability uh, makes universities less uh, dependent on us. So I think that that is the underlying factor. John. You've outlined very clearly the present conditions and offered some suggestions uh, very specific about addressing it. Have you seen in your experience, in your observations, uh, situations in which this process was reversed, where the administration was diminished? Well, often people cite, um, let's see, a school called Case Western <laughs> as an example, um, where um, the faculty um, were able to mobilize the trustees and, um, you know, gain some success against um, the administration. Is that not true? They were already mobilized. Well, no, well, no, well, we'll, we'll take some credit for getting the trustees. <laughs> To see the light. Well, you know, you know, in in um, you know, my my friends uh, at Purdue say that they are are making some headway. Very often, faculty can make headway if they're able to make common cause with the trustees. Uh, and whether they can do that or not depends on the character of the board. Uh, if the board is one uh, that is mainly composed of university loyalists. Those people are eager to do what, what needs to be done to improve the quality of education at the school. Unfortunately, there are many boards uh, where a fair number of trustees serve 
because they want to do business with the university. You know, if you walk around many campuses, you see, I don't know if this is one, you see construction cranes that bear the names, the name of a trustee, delivery trucks that bear the name of a trustee. And those trustees will do nothing to fight the administration. Now, under federal contract, uh, conflict of interest law, uh, trustees can't charge the school more than the going rate. But that's not the problem. Uh, the problem is institutional power rather than money. Trustees who do business with the school will always support the administration. And you know, very often you'll see a battle in which a totally inept and incompetent president is supported to the end by the trustees or by some clique on the trustees. At American University, a president was looting the place, but the trustees supported him. They were doing business with the school. The, the well-known story is Boston University, where John Silber in his final days, I think had to be tied into his chair to, to, to stay up, but there were trustees doing business with the school. So one, you know, one solution, or you know, one, um, policy that I often advocate is to apply Sarbanes-Oxley to universities. Sarbanes-Oxley, you know, the 2002 Act, applies only to private sector corporations and a little bit to public sector entities. But Sarbanes-Oxley includes very, very strict conflict of interest rules. And uh, those rules, if applied to the university, could change the character of the board. It would create boards that took responsibility for their actions. Uh, boards that could not do business with the school. And at some schools, it would make a huge difference. Ken Ledford is next, I believe. But if they, who else wants to get in after Ken? Anybody? This is a question that's really directed toward the uh, executive search firms, the headhunter firms, uh, which we've experienced really just in the last decade, and you're absolutely correct. They've metastasized downward from presidential searches to provost searches to dean searches. Uh, clearly, those firms have a market-making retention interest in invoking uh, confidentiality which is then used by the Board of Trustees or the Provost or whoever's retained the firm to exclude the faculty, usually reduced to a token and hand-selected yes. single member. Right. Or in the case of our last presidential search, no faculty members. Yeah, that's become the norm. Uh, and, but they make the most stunning, bald-faced lie assertions. Uh, 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 in, in a public meeting here, I dealt with one who made the bald-faced claim that you can't get good people to apply for presidential or provostial positions if they know that at the stage of a finalist, their names will become public. I raised the question of public universities, where under open records and open meeting laws, the minute these are announced, they're published in the That's paper. right. I'm, I'm, I'm an undergraduate and law graduate of UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, and in this meeting, they frankly said, those schools all get second-rate uh, candidates and, and choose second-rate. Well, how could it be otherwise? <laughs> uh, what can we do? Because, because the trustees are business people, and this is the conspiracy that business people have entered into with executive compensation and executive search firms, they bring their known norms to the university. And of course, any president or provost will cooperate. Absolutely. How can the faculty Push back specifically on the cancer of the headhunter firm? Well, first of all, um, if there is a faculty trustee, yeah. that is a step in the direction of opening these searches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> second, second um, whether it's the faculty senate, assembly, or the AAUP chapter, it's important to uh, object vehemently, object vigorously. Uh, to us to a closed search and in the context of vehement faculty objection many candidates simply won't won't allow themselves to be nominated and the trustees are forced uh, to create a more open process I mean it, it 
it's, if the faculty can act collectively to bring this about, uh, the, or to, to make this demand, the trustees find it difficult to resist because they won't have candidates. Who wants to be president under those circumstances? So that would be my, my advice. I just want to ask a quick question about sort of the same theme, which is I consider the Dilbertization of the university, which is just so being overwhelmed with all these stupid things that are taken from uh, the business world and the, the management schools and uh, you know, the concept of best practices, which of course is never uh, linked to any measurement of cause and effect. Or right. Men, of very effect. often the best practice isn't even known to be a good practice. Right. Isn't <laughs> even known. But, um, but this seems to be a broad cultural kind of thing that's going on in, in some world. Well, can, you, can, you, can you talk a little about this I, I strategic think, plans, yeah. best practices, all that kind of stuff? Analysis. Yeah, or, uh, I, once when I was on the Hopkins Press Board, uh, a book was presented uh, to the board in which um, three professors of education study the impact of TQM on universities. So I raised my head, what the hell is that? Uh, it was total quality management, and their, their research design was to ask university administrators who allegedly had done this whether it worked for them or not. And you know they all said it did. So I said, you can publish this over my dead body. Uh, well, they waited until I was off the board and published it. But, but yes, this is, this is a, a very common thing. And again, I would say that a lot of it has to do with an effort by administrators to define the needed expertise as something that we don't have. So the more that they can spout uh, management jargon, uh, especially if they have MBAs, uh, the more they're able to say, well, you folks don't understand. Why don't you stick to your laboratory or the library? Uh, now, I used to always raise my hand and ask, ask for an explanation uh, of, um, you know, well, what is it? could you enlighten me? Uh, what is Six Sigma? And you know, it was, the explanations would always be so bizarre. Uh, you know, obviously they had no idea either. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, it, it's a claim of expertise designed um, to marginalize us. And you know, in the context of resist everything, that has to be resisted. Whenever they start spouting those buzzwords, challenge them. <laughs> Well, think how I thought while I was writing it. <laughs> in, in a way that at the same time I kind of lambaste yourself for being a party to this terrible shift that's going on. Um, but I did want to ask, in the, there's a gap between the story of, say, Purdue's faculty finding this making this chart that counteracts the, what the president said and actually making some impact with that knowledge or doing opposition research and finding out something that is a fib on someone's TV and getting that person put on the spot. So, you know, where do you go with this? Well, you know, that's, that's a very good question. And um, in part, it depends where you are. If you, are, if you are faculty at a uh, big state university in a college town, the local media won't cover your, your activities, okay, because they are captives. Um, you know, I was reminded of this um, at the University of Illinois a few years ago. There was a terrible, tragic incident uh, where a political science professor was hounded from the department by the administration and uh, on the basis of completely false charges um, of racism based on an article he wrote under contract to the government of an African country, uh, an article that the government of the country liked very much. But he was hounded out of his department and killed himself. And the local press simply wouldn't cover the story because they're so dependent on the school. On the other hand, if you're in Cleveland or Baltimore or Washington, the media cheerfully cover conflict. If you demand documents and the administration won't produce them, that's stonewalling. If your opposition research produces uh, some fibs, well, that's news. So if you're in a, in a metropolitan area, uh, you have weapons at your disposal. 
But un unfortunately, I mean, my friends at Purdue discovered that the uh, local newspaper wouldn't cover anything that they came up with. That made it harder for them. Um, but you know, uh, someone asked about strategic planning, and th those of you who've read the book uh, know my views on strategic planning. Uh, this is uh, not only a waste of time, uh, but uh, generally an instrument of co-optation. Every new administrator um, wants to develop a new strategic plan uh, and puts the faculty to work for a year. It's all busy work. We should never cooperate with this. Because what happens at the end? Have you had a strategic plan here? What happened? Do you remember anything about it? Oh, yes. It's yes. cited all the time in all sorts of discussions. They, yeah. they, they, and then some people even think that it was a faculty product. It's, well, it's less cited than encanted. Encanted. <laughs> well, most strategic plans are filed uh, where they join their their predecessor's strategic plans. You know, in my vision, all the strategic plans are playing with one another in a file cabinet and having a wonderful time. Uh, I always say, why not use the old strategic plan? It's just as good as the new one, but this is dismissed. Then I discovered that a lot of strategic plans are plagiarized. Plagiarism in planning is very common, and several university presidents have been fired for plagiarizing other people's plans. I say they should be, they should be rewarded. <laughs> Why not? The same plan. <laughs> they saved a lot of money. Um, but you know, I, I tell the story in the book. One year, we, we were working on our, I don't forget which strategic plan it was, our third or our fourth. And at lunch at the faculty club, I you know, amused myself by making fun of the plan. Well, several people there were involved in the planning process, and they got really mad at me. You know, I was attacking their work product. Um, now, I now ask them, do you remember anything about that plan you worked on? They're, oh, shut up, of course not. It's all <laughs> it was a total waste of time, but it's an instrument through which administrators uh, declare themselves to be in charge. You know, it's like the inaugural, inaugural address. Now, I say there, too, the president could give his predecessors an inaugural address. No, no one would know the difference. Uh, but each new president has to give a new address, an assertion of leadership. We had um, a uh, dean a few years ago who launched a planning exercise in which we were all supposed to be involved. So for a year, any time you would come to him with an idea for doing something, he would say, well, that might be a good idea. But we have to wait until our plan is complete to see if it comports with the plan. Well, after a year, the plan was complete, and he announced that he was leaving uh, to become president of a small college. And so his plan was put in the file cabinet with, with all the old plans. Uh, now, as soon as he arrived at his new job, he announced a new planning process. So I peeked at his new plan. It's churning. Well, it looked a lot like our old plan. Now, you know, I thought, well, all right, we'll leave him to his planning. I didn't want to suggest that he perhaps had plagiarized his old plan. But I, I said, besides, his old plan had done us no harm. It had gone right into a file cabinet. So probably the, its um, you know, new life as his new college's plan would probably be harmless, too. He was probably off job hunting during the process. Um, so, you know, the strategic planning, it's not that you couldn't possibly have a valuable plan, but that's not the way we do it. Uh, our plans are a waste of time. I just wanted to follow up on that just a little, because it is always possible that things like strategic plans are ways to, to deal with trustees. In other words, in that, uh, you have to show the trustees that uh, you have a basis for choosing among resource allocations that you have a purpose, that there's, you have to be able to tell the trustee something other than, well, I feel like it, yeah. in order to justify it. Well, that's, you know, that, that's sometimes true. The tri and the particularly trustees who come from a business background, they're accustomed to planning. Uh, but, you know, I don't think the trustees, uh, I, I think the trustees would be happy with a relatively short document that lists options and, and uh, directions. Not, you know, our last plan was 100 pages of drivel. Any trustee who read that probably had to be committed at the end. Um, but, you know, but I, I, I mean, you're not wrong. Um, you know, I guess we're running out of time, but one, one uh, story that I, that I want to end with um, is the result of a little bit of research I did while I was writing this book. Now, those of you who have read the book can't, do not answer this question. Um, I asked myself, 
Every time I walk by, I see administrators and staffers at meetings. Every time I walk past administrative suites, they're meeting. And I wondered, what are they meeting about? What, what could there possibly be to meet about? Well, as you've indicated, public universities, especially in the Western states, have open meetings laws. So the minutes and agendas of meetings have to be posted. So I was able to do online research to find out what they met about. And I made what I thought was an astonishing discovery. There was one topic that dominated administrative and staff meetings at all the schools I looked at. Now, the next time I got to lunch, I asked my colleagues. Usually Cargan will know the answer to these things, but I said, what do you think they meet about? And nobody knew. People guessed money. Nah. Some people said the curriculum. Oh, that's ridiculous. The strategic plan. No. What was it? I asked one of our vice provosts. And she looked at me. She said, well, I thought everybody knew this. And she got it right. The main topic in administrative and staff meetings is a discussion of previous meetings and a discussion of plans for future meetings. So they meet to discuss meetings, to plan meetings. It's the world of meetings in which there is no substance. <laughs> Anybody else have a question to, to follow up? If, if so, we'll have to meet. I, 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 nobody? Okay. No, that was supposed to be my end. What? Huh. Yeah, Ted, stop going. You want to tell your story? Uh, that's, a story. Uh, okay. that's a dinner story. It doesn't take too long to. to okay. Well, I want to hear your story. Uh, with that, with that big buildup, I want to. <laughs> um, I, I, I do want to. I do want to follow up on. Uh, you know, there does appear to be some growth in things like IT and stuff like that, and there's uh, way one maybe. Maybe there's a need for more. At the same time, there's a growth in, as you've mentioned, all of these services for students that aren't, at, aren't what, what we do, or things that are said to be services for students that aren't what we do. Um, do you have a sense of whether the students want, or, or, or whether the extent to which there's any demand for things like all these extra student services? Yes. Service learning. Yes. Well, the students don't know what they need to know. Okay, what I, I don't, you know, the students are not, uh, you know, sort of the customers with preferences uh, of neoclassical economics. Students are kids. Um, you know, I picked up the Washington Post the other day, and there was a story about a new program at Virginia Tech, and this was service learning, and a big picture, the learning kitchen, and students were working happily in the learning kitchen. Now, I guess, I mean, you know, there, may, there might be something to be learned in the learning kitchen, but the problem is that when, when staff in the dean of students' office present these things, they confuse the students. The students don't know that the learning kitchen is playtime uh, and that they really should do their math homework. Uh, the students don't know that all this, uh, this shadow curriculum that the, that the staffers in the Dean of Students Office have created is just fluff and is not a substitute for learning because it's presented to them as being the equivalent. We had a staffer at Hopkins who wrote a big article in the student newspaper explaining that um, students, college students needed to develop life skills as well as academic skills, which of course were unrelated to life. Uh, and what were some of these life skills? Well, the one that he uh, felt was most important, the, the ultimate life skill, uh, was event planning. And he said many students didn't know how to plan an event. Well, la-di-da. <laughs> And, you know, why not do event planning? Isn't that as important as calculus and history and English? We have students who can't write a, who can't write a paragraph, but they can cater a meal now. Uh, so this, you know, this is uh, asking what the students want is the wrong question. I don't care what they want. They don't know what they want. You know, I had a student a few years ago who wa told me she wanted to learn. She, wa she told me she wanted to um, be a commodities trader. I said, well, what do you know about this? Oh, it's very interesting, you know, and 
Uh, her father, her friend's father was one. It seemed really interesting. All right. Well, she got a summer job working as a commodities trader. And she reported back in the fall that it was a terrible profession. Terrible. I said, why? She said, well, they're only interested in making money. <laughs> uh, I said, well, yeah, they're, they're, that's what they do. Well, she thought that they were focused on mental math, which she enjoyed. Uh, so, you know, kid, they're kids. Some, you know, you, that's what we do. We explain to them uh, the difference between being waterlogged in the swimming pool, learning water polo, and doing your calculus. We explain to them that the learning kitchen, you know, that's kind of for fun. That's not a subject. And as for event planning, get a, you know, get a good degree and hire your own caterer. You don't need to know how to do that. <laughs> So that's what, that's what we're for, and that's why the Dean of Students Office, much as it likes to cater to the customers, much it likes, as it likes to be customer friendly and produce the happy you, is doing the wrong thing. It's doing them a disservice. Thank you very, very much.